Another thing, a lot of these countries I was visiting, they don't have the same liability laws they have in the US. So they offer what they call adventure sports, which are basically things that are pretty unsafe. And you, know, you can sign a little form, they give you a little form, and the form is basically two sentences which says, you know, if you get hurt or killed, bummer. So uh, one of the uh, centers for adventure sports is Queenstown, New Zealand. So New Zealand has two islands, North Island and South Island. Queenstown is in the South Island. And one of the activities they offered was something called river boarding. So you've heard of whitewater rafting. This is just whitewater rafting without the raft. As you can see, they have, uh, they're using, we use boogie boards, which is just a giant kickboard. And so you, you know, there's the leader waving everyone. Okay, yeah, water's great, let's go into the rapids. Uh, here's a photo of somebody in the rapids. They got the helmet, I, I guess they're photographing. So I went river boarding, wouldn't do it again. But there was another activity that I tried. So this particular jump is about 450 feet. They bind your feet up with this cord, go to the end of the plank, and then you ask the guy, you know, are you sure this is a good idea? And he's busy doing something else. You yell, mommy, and you jump. So you bounce up and down, and when you've stopped bouncing, they have a giant winch that brings you back up to the platform. So I did this three times. Uh, this, this particular jump in New Zealand, about 450 feet. Uh, the biggest, biggest jump I did was in South Africa, and that was about 660 feet. So that's the, that's the equivalent of going to the top of the hub in downtown Boston, then like jumping out one of the windows. They measure, when they're talking about the distance, they measure from the platform, all the way down to the ground, but the bungee cord doesn't go all the way down to the ground because that would hurt a lot. So I did this three times, uh, never saw, I never had any problems, never saw anyone have any problems, or at least with injuries. Uh, one time I went, you had, we had somebody freak out on the platform, which is particularly bad because it's, you know, you're like, you're, everyone's pretty scared. And it's like a, a, a nursery school class where one kid starts crying and everybody starts crying. So this one person started freaking out. We all, we all started freaking out, but uh, they eventually jumped. We all jumped, we were fine. Um, and again, I didn't see anyone have any problems, but apparently there have been some problems. New Year's Eve and 22-year-old Australian Erin Langworthy's bungee jump over the Zambezi River has a certain style as she sets off. Then disaster as her jumping cord snaps and she plunges into the crocodile infested waters. It went black um, straight away and I felt like I'd been slapped all over. She came to in the swirling rapids but with her feet tied together still not out of danger. I actually had to swim down and yank the bungee cord out of whatever it was caught into. Erin eventually managed to reach the bank of the river where rescuers pulled her out battered and bruised, but even then her ordeal wasn't over. When I was first pulled out of the water, they put me on my back. And so all the water that I'd inhaled um, meant that I couldn't breathe. So um, I made them roll me onto my side and that's when I started coughing out water and blood. The safari company that organized the jump calls it 111 meters of pure adrenaline on its website. But another look at Erin's jump shows just how lucky she was. Yes, I think it's definitely a miracle that I survived. Nazanin Sadri, Al Jazeera. Still, there was one thing I feared more than dying in a bungee jumping accident. And here it is.
the squat toilet. And for those of you who've never used one, let me just describe what the experience is like. Inside the little room, I reach for a light switch and can't find one. I reach for the door and can't find one. Against the back wall, there's a hole in the floor surrounded by raised porcelain footrests. Across from it, a saucepan floats in a plastic barrel filled with water. Something with legs and a tail skitters up the wall and onto the ceiling. A faucet protruding from the tiled wall drip drips into the plastic barrel. A boiling sensation intensifies deep inside me. I drop my pants and hover over the hole. I grab the rim of the barrel with one hand for stability. With the other hand, I point myself back like a little hose. Money starts to slip out of my pockets. As I go to catch the cash, my um, apparatus springs free and sprays my sandals, feet, and pants. All I can do is let it all go. I think you get the idea, but if you want to know more, you'll have to buy my book. So all the pain, misery, and suffering of the trip was actually good preparation for my next odyssey. Book publishing. I know there's some authors out there so they know exactly what, 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 what's coming. So I mentioned I was on this trip. I was lonely, depressed, miserable, perfect, perfect mindset for writing. So I kept a blog. And uh, by the time I got back, I had 150 pages of blog material. And this was two, when I, I got back, it was uh, early 2008. And around this time, there was another, so I was going to write a travel memoir because that seemed to be the, the thing. Remember this travel memoir, Eat, Pray, Love? By 2007, she sold 5 million copies. I figured 1% of that, 50,000, I'll be happy with that. There's also another uh, travel guidebook, that a uh, travel memoir that I wrote, read, and uh, The Sex Lives of Cannibals. This is a guy's travel guidebook, kind of like me, you know, whiny white guy goes to an uh, exotic island, he goes to the South Pacific, has a miserable rotten time, writes a funny book about it. So I was like, okay, I worked for a computer magazine for 15 years, I should be able to do this. So I, Took some writing classes, joined some writing groups, went to some overpriced writing conferences. And at the end of a year and a half, I had a travel memoir. And I showed it to an agent, and the agent said, eh, you know what? Uh, travel memoirs are kind of passe. The hot thing now are memoirs. So this was two th uh, 2008, 2009. So there was a, a memoir called Running With Scissors takes place in Western Massachusetts, the book did very well, and the movie had just come out. So this was kind of a hot, hot genre, memoirs. Around this time, there was another popular memoir. There's a book called A Million Little Pieces by James Fry. And so what, what James Fry did was, initially this book was a novel, and he couldn't sell it. So he thought, hmm, silly me, it's all true. So he it was a memoir and it sold and it sold a lot of copies and it got selected by Oprah Winfrey for her book club. So James Fry is on Oprah's show and they're talking about his book and he mentions that, yeah, it's not so true. So kind of embarrassing. He still sells lots of books. It was a great book. I read it. I read the, the sequel to it. I didn't care whether it was true or not. It was well written. It was a lot of fun. So I figured, you know, the memoir thing doesn't even need to be that true. So I sign up for more writing classes, join more, more writing groups, attend more overpriced writing conferences. And after a year and a half, I have a memoir. And I show it to an agent and the agent goes, eh, you know what? There's really no market for memoirs anymore unless you're a Kennedy. And I was like, I am a Kennedy. So that didn't work. 
anyway, she said, the, hot, the best way as a debut writer, debut author to sell your book is to make it a novel. So more writing classes, more writing groups, more overpriced writing conferences. End of a year and a half, I have a novel. And I show it to an agent and the agent goes, you know, this would probably make a very good travel memoir. So I was like, ah, ah, ah. Then I thought to myself, you know, I just took this trip around the world and I survived this. I survived this. And I survived this. So I doubled down. I decided I'm going to rewrite the novel again. We can make this better. We can, we can sell this thing. So I start more writing classes, more writing groups, more overpriced writing conferences. And the other thing is around this time, I started uh, reading bits and pieces of the novel at uh, open mics around town. And uh, the other thing is I was at a party and I met a theater guy and we started talking and he was like, yeah, you know, you got a lot of material. I can help you turn that into a one hour, one man show that you can perform at fringe festivals. Now, fringe festivals, there's a, these are amateur theater festivals, and there's a circuit of them that goes all around the U.S., U.S. and Canada, all around the world. The big one is in Edinburgh, Scotland. So with this, this guy's help, we turned it into a one-hour, one-man show called The Chronic Singles Handbook. And let me just tell you about it. The Chronic Singles Handbook is about a chronically single guy who takes a trip around the world hoping to change his luck with love. So it sounds kind of wholesome and sweet. You've heard of Eat, Pray, Love? Actually, this is nothing like Eat, Pray, Love. There's adult situations, adult language, and more adult situations. So there's twice your daily adult requirement for adult situations. However, it's based on a novel. So these are high-end literary adult situations. This is not the cheap sleazy stuff. Actually, and let me do a, here's a scene from, uh, from an early version of the show. And this particular scene is called One Day in Thailand. Bangkok. Bang. The name alone sounds skeevy. And the moment I get off the plane, I'm on high alert. I'd read about the deep fried tarantulas, tuk tuk scammers, and locals that play volleyball with their feet. The de decor in the airport doesn't help either. Smirking Buddhas, sneering Buddhas, a gang of Buddhas pummeling a three-headed snake. The airport bus drops me downtown on Sukhumvit Road. That's a boulevard that's supposed to be two blocks my hotel. On the corner stands a local woman. She's wearing a t-shirt that says, University of Nebraska. That's Nebraska with just one P. The whole area is peppered with little carts selling noodles and soup. I start to walk in the sooty, humid air, stinks like a lung full of red ants. Immediately, I'm lost, so I approach a guy. He's got a mossy, blonde beard growing down his sternum. He's wearing a fishing vest and shorts, and the chin strap on his wide-brimmed hat is pulled snug against his jowls. He looks like he's bracing for a typhoon. Uh, excuse me, I ask, do you know how to get to a street called Soy 38? You from the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I'm from Somerville, Massachusetts. Yeah, I'm from Texas. I was an MP back in Saigon, one of the last guys out, last guys out. Uh, wow, um, do you know, is it okay to eat any of these food carts around here? Oh, you don't want to eat around here. Soy cowboys, just a few subway stops, subway stops. This whole Sukhumvit area is built on a swamp. I'm gonna retire here, retire here. Then he exhales into his hand, and sniffs his breath. In less than two minutes, this guy has confirmed my worst fears about Southeast Asia. This place can do things to you, permanent, mind-warping things. I put on my hat, tighten my chin strap, and walk away. Walk away. So that was my show, Chronic Singles Handbook. I did it in 26 different fringe festivals. I did the big one in Edinburgh, Scotland. And in the early going, I was getting a lot of, getting some decent reviews. So here's 
four stars the Winnipeg Free Press. If you insist, I'll read you some of the other ones. Ross's honesty makes the self-deprecating voyage of sometimes lurid self-discovery a lot of fun to watch. Winnipeg Fringe Festival. A delightful show that kept the crowd laughing at all the right times. A fringe show that is worth seeing for the chronically single and very married alike. Orlando Fringe Festival. Sharply funny. Some of life's tougher punchlines. A quality so solo show. Edinburgh Fringe Festival. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. My show's getting good reviews. I'm getting packed houses. And I finally finished the novel. 2015, novels done. It's 80,000 words. So it's about 325 Microsoft Word pages. And the way the process works, if you wanna, if you wanna get a big book contract, a big book deal with a big publisher, you need to get a literary agent first. In order to get a literary agent, you have to write something called a query letter. So this is basically just a pitch letter. And I spent three years on mine and let me read it to you. So query letter uh, has basically three parts. Uh, the beginning, first paragraph, you describe your book in one sentence and you mention where it fits into the marketplace. Middle, middle paragraph, you describe what the book is about. And the last paragraph is your qualifications as a writer. And basically I had none. I've been working for a computer magazine. The other thing is, uh, so the novel, the, the working title I had for the novel was The Loneliest Planet. So take off on the Lonely Planet guidebooks that were so helpful on my trip. Uh, the other thing is the narrator, uh, his name was Randall Burns. I use my first name, Randy, because if you're in South Africa or Australia, Randy's a very, they, they all get a laugh out of that first name. Dear Agent, my comedic novel, The Loneliest Planet, offers an unflinching look at how men feel about sex, love, marriage, and massage parlors. The audience includes men seeking insight into their own psyches, women seeking insight into men, and anyone interested in a gritty, bittersweet romantic comedy. It should appeal to readers of Jonathan Tropper, Joshua Ferris, and Sam Lipsight. So these three authors are whiny Jewish guys writing about their writing about mishaps in their relationships. Uh, jo uh, Jonathan Tropper, he had a book uh, that was turned into a movie uh, called "This Is Where I Leave You." It was out probably four or five years ago. Uh, Adam Driver was in it, a big cast. So this is what I want the agents to think, think of when they were looking at my book. And here's the description of the book. The story follows the picaresque adventures of Randall Burns, 48, chronically single, and recently downsized out of a long time job. Hmm. Sounds a little familiar. He blows his severance on a trip around the world, hoping to change his luck with love. On the trip, Burns strikes out with women on three continents and suffers loneliness that would have broken Papillon. On the fourth continent, Burns accepts that he's gonna die alone and the sooner the better. Yeah, I kinda like that line. Uh, he bungee jumps, eats food from street carts and visits a body spa named the Curious Finger. He lets go of his germophobia and his quest for a woman and begins to enjoy himself. His ex-girlfriend emails, She's now on antidepressants and sorry for her past behavior. Is his luck with love about to change? So that was my pitch letter and I sent it to 30 agents and none of them wanted it. I sent it to 40 agents, 40 more agents and none of them wanted it. I sent it to 30 more agents and none of them wanted it. So I sent it to a total of 110 agents. I was gonna send it to 120. And where I got that number from was I was at a writing conference and I was talking to an agent. And the agent said one of his clients has had queried 120 agents. And this particular guy I was talking to, this agent was number 120. He bought the book and the book and sold the book and the book became a movie and it was called The Silver Linings Playbook. So I did 110, I pitched 110 agents 
Seven of them requested the manuscript and then didn't want it. After 110, I was done. So the way the process works, you want a big publisher, big book deal, big money, need an agent. Your next option is to go be your own agent and pitch your book to small publishers, small presses. So I sent the book out to five small presses and these guys were interested. One, Friday, Friday, one night in February, I get a call at 6 p.m. Publisher from the permanent press likes my book. Uh, they're going to they're offer me $1,000, but I should take a look at the contract. So as I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time on the internet. And what I had found when I started doing more research on small presses was stuff like this. So this is a website, I think it's gone now, but it was called Predators and Editors. So it's all about small presses that are scammers and fraud artists and ripoffs and fleece artists. And here's another one uh, called Writer Beware. And this is an article about a, a publisher that's not paying their authors. So I'm thinking scammers, fleece artists, crooks, scammers, fleece artists, crooks, parasites, parasites, parasites. So I'm getting a little freaked out. So I decide to hire an expert, a lawyer. So the lawyer goes through the contract. The contract was only two pages. And the lawyer says, you know, basically this is fine. Here are some suggestions. So I get all the lawyer's suggestions and I'm a little nervous about, you know, this is the big negotiation. I've been working on this book for 10 years of my life. Don't want to screw this up. So I put together all this, you know, all these, you know, if this, then, you know, all these charts and spreadsheets and I'm, I'm preparing for the big, the big negotiation, but I'm not ready yet. I decided to call my father. So my father uh, is in his eighties, small businessman his whole life. This guy knows about negotiating. So I call him up and I say, Hey dad, I got this uh, contract I'm negotiating tomorrow. Any advice? My father says, well, uh, how many other offers do you have? None. Shut up and sign the contract. So I sign the contract. Next issue is the publisher is the next issue is, okay, so I signed the contract. The next issue was the cover. So typically uh, the small presses, they'll send you a couple covers. These guys only sent me one and I wasn't so happy with it. And the issue for me was, okay, see so these, this, this publisher specializes in literary fiction. My book's literary fiction. There's no beer bottles in literary fiction. I mean, that should be a wine flute or a, a champagne glass or a martini glass or not a beer bottle. So they sent me this cover option and they also sent me the author photo. So I was like, hmm, hmm. So I consulted a bunch of friends who knew about as much about book publishing as I did. And they were like, you know what? Tell them you want to use the, the author photo as your cover. I was like, sounds like good advice to me, but there's one person I should consult before I do anything, before the big negotiation. So I call my house and my father's not home. My mother picks up the phone and I email her the two photos. And she says, so, Mr. Big Shot book author, how long have you been in book publishing? Uh, my, it's, I think it's been about six weeks. How long have they been in book publishing? Uh, uh, 35 years. Shut up, the contract's, the, the cover's fine. So we settled on the cover, signed the contract, settled on the cover. Another issue. So it, with the contract, the publisher sent me this author letter. And in the author letter, it basically said, you know, actually, let me read it to you. Dear author, before you sign your contract, I'd already signed it. We wanted you to know what the book world is like. Generally speaking, books by non-celebrities sell between 700 and 1500 copies. To even ensure that many sales, it is imperative that the pre-publication reviews be good ones. And there was another clause in there, basically, no reviews, no book. So the way this works, 
three months before your book's supposed to come out, the publisher sends out copies to reviewers. So my book was supposed to come out in March, November. They sent out copies to a bunch of reviewers. December 21st, no reviews. December 28th, no reviews. January, I get a call from the publisher. He's not so happy. The book has not been reviewed, so there's not going to be a book. They'll do an ebook, but there's not going to be any physical book. And I'm begging, I'm pleading, I'm crying. You know, 10 years of my life, and I'm suffering, I'm suffering here. I'm, you know, I, I offer to buy the whole print run. I'm in my therapist's office, I'm on the carpet crying and begging. It's so cruel, the world's so cruel. And two weeks later, I get a call from the publisher. My book got reviewed by Kirkus. A couple of weeks later, it gets reviewed by Booklist, which is something that librarians read. So, after all the diseases and the parasites and the guinea worms and the great white sharks and the bungee jumping and the youth hostels and the query letters and the agents and the rejections. finally got my book. Great. Thank you. Um, for any folks that have comments, I'm going to, this, this show, as actually I, I was doing it on Zoom, it's being streamed to Facebook Live. I'm going to get out of Zoom. I'm going to go check and see if there's any, any comments. And if you want to buy the book, GodBlessCambodia.com. If you want to donate some money, that's always appreciated as well. Uh, but thank you for your time.